grace and peace be with you. I'm Paul Stevens. I'm the ordained minister in placement at St. Luke's Uniting Church in Highton. This video service has been created through the shared leadership of the Western Heights and St. Luke's Uniting Church congregations and is the last in a series of videos delving into the themes of Tom Wright's book, God and the Pandemic, a Christian reflection on the coronavirus and its aftermath. In this video, the Reverend Bruce Waldron, who's the Supply Minister at the moment for the Western Heights Congregation, will be helping us to put together some of the key biblical insights that we have highlighted over the last five weeks in this series, with a particular focus on how following the way of Jesus gives shape to the response we offer in a world impacted by the coronavirus. When I was a student minister, a wise presbytery minister said to a group of us that uh, he had an old-fashioned habit when visiting ministers in his care. And that habit was asking the question, how goes it with your soul? It's a good question. And I don't think really it's an old-fashioned one either. Think for a moment. How might you respond to the question, how goes it with your soul? Are you buoyed by something of the joy of spring? Or is the journey of life really getting to you? Are there things weighing on your heart, your mind, your soul as you share in this service? Are there things that need dealing with? Relationships that need mending? Matters that require grace and forgiveness? In the words of that old hymn, let's spend a few minutes taking it to the Lord in prayer. Let's take all the things that are weighing on us or buoying us up to God in prayer. Let's pray. Compassionate God, in the gift of this time of prayer, we open our lives, our hearts, our souls to you. Minister to us and through us. Loving God, you bring healing into the broken places of life. Bring healing to the raw and hurting places in our lives today. God of peace, whose spirit of peace can quiet the spirits of confusion and despair, reassure us today. Forgiving God, whose call to repentance promises grace upon grace, place your mercy in our souls today. You heal the sick and liberate the imprisoned. You bring justice in the midst of oppression and strength in the midst of weakness. Pour out your spirit of power upon us today. Open our hearts to new faithfulness, redirect our waywardness, and hold us gently in your goodness. We confess our need to you, and we turn to you with hearts filled with hope, remembering the promises you have made to us. May your name be glorified in us and through us. We ask it through Christ Jesus, your only begotten Son, he who is our Lord and our Saviour, our brother and our friend. Amen. Our Bible reading this morning is taken from Matthew, chapter 12, verses 15 to 21 and verses 38 to 42. In this reading, Jesus has confronted some Pharisees with the challenge that God's compassion for the suffering has precedence over their, their adherence to the rigidity of the law. The, re the response of these Pharisees is to plot his death. We pick up the reading at verse 15. When Jesus became aware of this, he departed. Many crowds followed him and he cured all of them and he ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfil what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not wrangle or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed, will quench a smouldering wick until he brings justice to victory and in his name the Gentiles will hope. And then reading from, commencing from verse 38. 
Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was for three days and three nights in the belly of a sea monster, so for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. The people of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the proclamation of Jonah, and see, something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon, and see, something greater than Solomon is here. This is the Lord, word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the Pharisees, they want to see a sign. And Jesus tells them, don't go looking for a sign. You're not going to get a sign except for the sign of Jonah. What does he mean by that? Well, there is a sign. It's right in front of them, a pure reflection of God's might and power. But it's not the sign the people wanted. And Jesus wasn't going to give them the kind of sign they wanted. They wanted a sign of the power and might of God. But the type of power and might they were after inevitably means that somebody is going to be disempowered. Someone is going to be the subject of that power and that might. The people who Jesus is encountering here in this narrative from Matthew's Gospel, they haven't been able to read the sign that Jesus is. They haven't been able to understand the nature of power and might. Their image of power and might is drawn from the political world around them. They want the same nature of power and might but they wanted it inscribed with God's name instead of Caesar's name and with them on top instead of the Romans. Now, the only signs that Jesus performed were miracles that bound up wounds. The only power he demonstrated was the power to heal and to restore. And the one time he directly encounters the type of power and might that some of these scribes and Pharisees want. He let it roll over him and crucify him and kill him. Except that it can't be killed because it's the power and might of God and you can't kill that. What is the sign of Jonah? It's the sign of a person who allows himself to be immersed in the power of the storm because he knows that in doing so, he will save others. The sign that God gives in Jesus is the sign of God entering into the sorrow and the suffering and the sadness and the injustice and the rage of our world. Not as one power of rage stronger than another power of rage and therefore dominating it in that way. But as one who bears the pain, who enters into the pain, who weeps for the pain, who dies in the pain and yet still offers resurrection. The signs of lament that we started with in the early chapters of Tom Wright's book, 
they're not a sign of the helplessness of God. They're a sign of the presence of God. They're included there to let us know that the power and the might of God is at work right there in the midst of pain and lament and confusion and suffering. We should never underestimate the potential for resurrection and for restoration and renewal that's in the midst of pain and suffering. I've seen some of the most remarkable things in a person's life happen in palliative care in the last days, the last hours of their life, sometimes in the very moment at which their life leaves the body. I've sometimes seen people come to find profound inner depths in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of their most difficult moments. I knew a man, a very deeply humble man, a man who utterly gave everything to walking the way of Jesus, to trying to follow Christ. He and his wife had adopted a little girl, a three-year-old. But things had been very difficult in her early years and at times, particularly, she got older, she poured out some of that rage and hurt from those times before she was ever adopted into this family. And there was one occasion where he told me the story once. And he told me this story when he was in the final stages of his life, suffering from cancer, and this girl, now a woman, had become the most wonderful support that he could imagine. And he tells the story of this day when she was a teenager, standing toe to toe, nose to nose with him, screaming with a twisted face in rage into his face, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And the only thing he could think to say in that moment was, well, that's all right, darling, because I'll still love you. The cross tells us so vividly that God is there in the midst of suffering, in the midst of injustice. Jesus' whole life reassures us of the same thing, his presence there and where he goes and what he does shows us that God is there in the midst of suffering time and time again. It doesn't mean we should acquiesce and just let evil be because God will somehow make it right. It doesn't mean that at all. But the Psalms of lament tell us very clearly that it's okay and God can be there in the midst of lament and confusion and pain and rage against injustice and that the grief of suffering and the expression of that grief, the getting to know that grief, is part of our faithfulness to God. The Psalms of Lament tell us that in the suffering and in the confusion, in the not knowing the answers, God is right there. God hasn't abandoned us. I mean, Jesus did it. He immersed himself in the storm. We read of him weeping with his dear friends at the death of Lazarus. We read of him going into the tomb of the madman we read of him walking into the tax collector's home. We read of him touching the lepers. 
we read of him sweating drops of blood in Gethsemane. The sign that Jesus alludes to when he talks about the sign of Jonah is himself. Now that sign of Jesus reaffirms the reality that God is there when we're swamped over by the storm and by the waters. And knowing that, being sure of that, looking for that presence in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of perhaps the loneliness of the COVID-19 restrictions, perhaps in the grief of someone who's died that we don't know how to live without it, shifts what happens from the bitterness of hopeless despair and resentment to hopeful watchness, watchfulness, hopeful watchfulness in the faith that the God of life is still there in the midst of all that. As Tom Wright comes to the end of his book, he talks about how important it is to be part of the healing and not to be part of the hurting. He points out that church buildings are never meant to be, perhaps faith is never meant to be an escape from the world, but a bridgehead into the world. In the film Amazing Grace, Wilberforce has a conversation with John Newton. He says to John, I'm divided. I don't know if I should be a minister preaching the word or whether I should be a politician for God and taking on the slavers. John Newton says to him, do it, Will. You will be infected by the stench of it. You will be manacled by the chains of it. You will be wounded by the wounds of it. But for God's sake, do it. Richard Raw talks about faith having a cruciform shape. It does. Jesus said to his followers, if you want to be my disciples, you must be prepared to take up your cross and follow me. Let's
In this time of COVID-19, we pray, using some words that uh, come to us from the United Church of Canada. Let's pray. Please pray with me. When we aren't sure, God, help us to be calm. When information comes from all sides, correct and not, help us to discern. When fear makes it hard to breathe and, and anxiety seems to be the order of the day, Slow us down, God. Help us to reach out with our hearts when we can't touch with our hands. Help us to be socially connected when we have to be socially distant. Help us to love as perfectly as we can, knowing that perfect love casts out all fear. For doctors we pray, for the nurses we pray, for technicians and janitors and aides and caregivers we pray for the researchers and theorists, for epidemiologists and investigators, for those who are in positions of leadership, for those who are sick, for those who are grieving, we pray. For all who are affected all around the world, we pray for safety, for health, for wholeness. May we feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked and house those without homes. May we walk with those who feel they are alone and may we do all that we can to heal the sick in spite of the epidemic, in spite of the fear. Help us, O oh God, that we might help each other. We pray in the name of Christ, the way, the truth and the life. Amen. Herginesis, Surpieriti Anunco, Egeste Arcaitunco, Eritin Ganco, Vorbes Herginesir Hergri, Zhats Merhana Bazort, Durmes Isor, Tormes Bardis Mer, Vorbes Yer Mek Tormunk Merots Bardavanats, Evnidan Yerismes E Portsutun, Ail Pergia E Charen. Ziko ye arkayutun ye zorutun ye park hagitians amen As we conclude our service I'd like to share with you firstly a prayer of commitment which you might like to make with me and also then some words of uh, dismissal words of mission and words of blessing First of all let's pray a prayer of commitment Almighty God, who gave the law through Moses and grace and mercy in Jesus Christ, grant, we pray, that this law of love may be so written upon our hearts that whatever we may do in your name, we do humbly. Whatever we seek in your kingdom, we seek faithfully. 
And whatever we give of ourselves, we give lovingly. Through the servant King, Jesus our Saviour, we pray. Amen. Friends, go into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. The blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest and remain with you always. Amen.